My understanding is particularly, I apologize particularly to you new fellows, my understanding is that last year your first invited speaker was Steve Coonan. This year you're just stuck with me, so. Um, but I will suspect that his title was not as outrageous as ultra-fast, ultra-powerful lasers create ultra-intense light to study the ultra-hot. So, at least I, I think I've got him on that, on that count. Okay, is that, does that work? Shall be good. Okay. So, okay, yeah, so I'm gonna talk about petawatt lasers. Most of you probably know what a petawatt is. Uh, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish up by talking about exawatt lasers, which is probably a prefix you haven't heard much of, okay? I'm gonna spend probably most of my time talking about the technology, but of course we'll talk about the physics that we're doing with this, and I can see there's something wrong, but. Switch on that. There you go. Of course, I don't actually do the work. I have a big crew of people that do this, so these are the folks. Anyway, I'm really fortunate to work with lots of great people, uh, and we have lots of collaborations with, with the labs, Livermore and Sandia in particular. Um, well, so, uh, as many of you probably know, this year marks the 50th anniversary of the demonstration of the first laser, okay? And so there's been much hoopla in, in the press about this. So one of the interesting threads in the development of the laser over the years has been this remarkable increase in the peak power that's available at the state of the art, okay? And I sort of just made a simple plot here, and every one of these ticks is three orders of magnitude, and a year along here, and this sort of represented, represents where the state of the art, where the highest power laser was as a function of the years. So if you think it's sort of kind of a Moore's Law scaling, it turns out that laser peak power has increased by about a factor of 1,000 every decade, okay? So which is a, which is a pretty remarkable, a remarkable thing if you think about it. it. Turns out that's been true of every decade except for the last one, okay? Um, the first petawatt laser was demonstrated about 10 years ago, um, and that's about where we've been for the last 10 years or so. We've been doing lots of good science, and I'll tell you about some of that, but uh, the time really has come to think about how we're gonna break out of that and why we might want to do that, and so that's where I'll, that's where I'll end my talk. Um, just, just as a tutorial for, the, for those of you who are, not, who are not laser folks, there have been a couple of technologies uh, in the early years of lasers, which have made all of this possible, okay? And the first was going from pulses that were milliseconds in duration, which was just the time scale, the pulse power, that pumps these lasers, to nanoseconds. And that was done actually within a, a, almost a year of, after the demonstration of the first laser by using a technique called Q-switching, okay? And the idea is to make a laser cavity, pump energy into the gain material, and then flip a switch very quickly, and all that energy comes out in a nanosecond time scale. A few years later, people figured out, well, gee, you know, we have this gain material in a laser cavity, and it, and it can support actually amplification of, of a number of different colors. Can we, can we create colors in a cavity and make them march in lockstep together? Okay, and this technique is called mode locking. And what that allowed us to do is to, is to by sort of simple Fourier arguments, you can see that if you can get all these uh, modes to lock up in phase, you'll end up with short pulses that come out, okay? And so that's been one of the tricks that has really revolutionized the way we're able to make very high peak powers is because we can produce light pulses with durations now of tens of femtoseconds, okay? I think the record now is something like four or five femtoseconds, okay? We don't amplify pulses quite that short, but, but almost. And so, okay, so in the, in the spirit of my various ultras and my subtitle, let's talk about the first one, ultra short pulses. Uh, the state-of-the-art lasers now operate at around 20 or 30 femtoseconds in duration. That's the same fraction of a minute that a minute is a fraction of the age of the universe, right? So, it's, so uh, you know, we're essentially making the fastest controlled man-made events. Okay, so, so the way people started pushing up in power after the invention of the first laser was to say, well, let's take laser pulses from an oscillator, those modes r r rattling around, and let's pass them through a series of amplifiers, okay? So this technique is called the uh, master oscillator power amplifier chain, and this is sort of the, this is the way all big high power lasers now are, are built, more or less, and, and the, the champion of this architecture for years has been Lawrence Livermore National Lab, right? So Livermore has built a, a series of larger and larger MOPA amplifiers where they amplify nanosecond pulses, and of course the motivation here is, is ICF, inertial confinement fusion. Um, uh, at the time I was in graduate school and uh, working at Livermore, of course this was the largest laser nova, 
And as everybody knows now, this has culminated in, in what will probably be the biggest laser for many, many years to come, which is the National Ignition Facility. Okay, but these are all nanosecond lasers. Okay, so in fact, the power of this system, although the energy is, is enormous, it's megajoules, the peak power of this laser is about 500 terawatts. Okay, a half, it's a half a petawatt. Okay, so, so as these big lasers were being built at Livermore, back in the mid 80s, people started asking, well, could we amplify these femtosecond pulses from mode lock lasers in one of these MOPA chains? And, and the answer is, if you don't do anything clever, you will quickly reach powers in the amplifier chain that are large enough that nonlinear effects start to occur. Okay, and the thing that really bites you initially is that the refractive index of any material actually has a very slight contribution from intensity. So where the pulse is most intense, the refractive index is slightly larger. So if you have a laser pulse or a laser beam that looks like this, the center will see a larger refractive index, and you've just turned your laser amplifier into a lens. Okay, this can focus, damage the material. It's a career-limiting mistake on a big laser. Okay, so, so, so how to circumvent this? So the trick to do this was invented uh, around 1985. Okay, and the answer is if we want to amplify very short pulses, we need to take advantage of the fact that a short pulse has a broad bandwidth. It's just the uncertainty principle, obviously, right? So if you, if you imagine a short pulse, and, and literally the pulses we deal with now are a few optical cycles, okay? Back in 1985, they were about a picosecond in duration. But nonetheless, if you can spread these colors out in time in a controlled way, you can temporarily make the pulse long. That lowers the power, makes it safe to amplify it, and now you use all that technology Livermore has done a nice job of developing to get to high energy, okay? So the way we do that is with gratings, okay? We can spread these colors out spatially, and by setting up gratings in such a way, we can make different colors travel different path lengths, okay? And so this lets us control the pulse duration in, in our amplifier chain. So this is the technique that we now use to reach the, these very high peak powers. We start with one of these mode-locked oscillators, which gives us femtosecond pulses. We spread the colors out in time, usually by a factor of about at least 10,000. Pulse is now 10,000 times lower in power. Safe to amplify, you amplify, 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 as much as money will allow. Um, and then you bring the colors back together. Now while the pulse is being amplified, the colors are spread out in time. So if I were to do that in sound, that would sound like this. Frequency sweeps. So it's like a chirp, it's an optical chirp. So this technique has been called chirped pulse amplification. Okay. It was first demonstrated in 1985 at the University of Rochester uh, by Gerard Moreau, uh, and that started a sort of a, a essentially a, a torrent of research on high power lasers in universities because for the first time now, very high peak powers could be accessed without building enormous facility sized machines. Okay. So, so, the, so currently where we're at with these, with these CPA, short pulse amplification lasers, is there really are two technologies that are commonly used, okay? One, which I won't talk much about, is, is based on using sapphire as the amplifier material. And the vast majority of CPA lasers around the world use this, okay? If you go to any chemistry you know, department in the country, there's somebody doing ultra-fast science and they use a Thai sapphire CPA laser. But the big daddies of these CPA lasers have typically been based on neodymium glass. Now glass is the same amplifier material used in the NIF, okay? So, so sapphire, the reason it's so widely used, it is really a great amplifier material for this application. For, first and foremost, the gain is very broad in bandwidth, okay? If we want short pulses, we need to amplify a lot of colors, and sapphire is great for that, okay? Um, the problem with pushing this to higher powers, because if you're a power maniac like me, you know, so I want to go to higher and higher powers, how do I do that? Well, I'm going to need ultimately bigger and bigger materials, and this ends up being a limitation. Sapphire has to be grown, and this is about as big as we can make it these days, but, and this costs quite a bit more than that. That's just shown for scale. Um, <laughs> trust me, I know. Um, so so this, this material is, is actually wonderful for amplifying tens of femtosecond pulses, but at the end of the day, we're really never going to get beyond a few tens of joules of energy with sapphire because of the crystal size. Now glass, the reason Livermore has spent years developing neodymium glass is you can make it big. Here, here's actually a continuous roll of NIF glass being made, okay? Of course, we can make high optical quality amplifier materials that are literally this large with glass, okay? And here, here's a picture down the chain of my laser. I'll talk more about this. This is a Nova amplifier. You can, you, you can make these glass amplifiers to large aperture, and large aperture means high energy, okay? 
Now, there is a, down, there is a trick, and there, there's a problem with glass. It doesn't have nearly as broad of a gain bandwidth as Thai Sapphire. Okay, here I plot the glass bandwidth. If you remember Sapphire, I went through too quickly, I know, but it was, had bandwidth of 100 nanometers, okay? Almost, not quite white light amplification, but you know, pretty close. Uh, glass only amplifies about 20 nanometers of bandwidth, okay? So narrower bandwidth means ultimately longer pulses at the end of the day. So this is a compromise you make. Essentially what happens if you try to amplify some spectrum, the middle part of the spectrum will get amplified more than the edges and that effectively narrows up the spectrum and that means at the end of the day I'll have a longer pulse. So I go through all this, all this work to get a short pulse amplified and it ends up coming out longer than I started. Okay, and so that's the compromise you're making with glass lasers. Um, but nonetheless, these things work and the largest CPA lasers have been based on glass, okay? So um, the Nova laser at the time in the 1990s produced about 100 kilojoules of energy, 10 kilojoules in each of 10 beam lines. So at the time I was at Livermore, I was a graduate student, my thesis advisor, Mike Perry, said, hey, you know, why don't we do this tabletop CPA trick on the biggest laser in the world? And everybody, including me, said, you're nuts. This is never gonna work, you're, you're smoking crack. I mean, there's no way because we don't have nearly large enough optics to do this. At the time, the biggest gratings you could buy to compress pulses were this big, and he needed gratings this large. Well, that guy went off and did it. So Livermore actually developed the capability to build gratings that are a meter in aperture, okay? So here, here, here are the gratings for that first petawatt laser. So Nova is a glass laser. So at the end of the day, what happened is they amplified pulses up to about 500 joules in a pulse duration of 500 femtoseconds. And we'll talk about focus intensity in a little bit. You can see there's a little rainbow from that photo of the, the, of the gratings. These were one of a kind at the time. I mean, these were, this was a spectacular technological achievement and I have to, I have to give it to Mike. Did something pretty remarkable. It, this thing has to be in vacuum. When you now have, so a petawatt is 10 to the 15 watts. If we have a petawatt, we can't even propagate that through air, okay? It's, the power is too high to propagate it through air. So that, so that final stage where we bring all the colors back together and compress it has to happen in vacuum. So there's Dee Pennington. You'll be happy to know that she gets out before they pump it down and everything worked. Okay, so a petawatt, just, this is, I like this number. So the, the power output of the US electrical grid is half a terawatt. Okay, so a petawatt of peak power is 2,000 times the power output of the entire United States electrical grid. Okay, I like this number better. If you take the state of Texas and take all the sunlight falling on the state of Texas, it's about 100 terawatts of power. Okay, so these petawatt lasers are brighter than the Texas sun. Right? Um, anyway, so, so, the, so the petawatt that was first demonstrated at Livermore back in 1998, I guess. Um, and I went to Texas and said, I can't let my thesis advisor have built a bigger laser than me. This is, <laughs> as many of you probably know, there often is a love-hate relationship with your thesis advisor. I love my advisor, but uh, we are also competitive. So, so we went off, and when I came to Texas, I said, wouldn't it be great if we had a, a machine like this that we could actually do academic research and, and have it available to have lots of students involved, okay? Now, when I looked at the science I wanted to do, which I'll tell you a little bit about here in a few minutes, I said, well, you know, that's great, but 500 femtoseconds is kind of a long pulse, right? Now I need, you know, do I need an entire Nova beam line? Is this, you know, this doesn't really seem to make sense. Um, but there's no way I could actually build a laser of this scale with Thai Sapphire. So the, so the trick that, that, that I played was just to go back and look at the kinds of glasses I have available. Now, NIF uses phosphate type glass, okay? The first big glass lasers that Livermore built up until, you know, the late 70s, early 80s, actually use a different glass, they use silicate glass, which is basically like the glass in your car window, right? So silicate glass has a very slightly different gain peak than phosphate, you can't really see it on this plot, but if you put those two together, they'll amplify slightly different colors. So by mixing glasses, so what we say, we mix glasses by using old silicate, this is old 1960s technology glass, with, with Nova or NIF style glass, we can amplify more bandwidth and the goal was to get down to pulses of 100 femtoseconds, okay? So five times shorter pulses than the initial Nova petawatt, which means now my laser can be five times lower energy. And that factor of five means a lot. It means a lot of money, and people like Keith are happy to hear that, right? So, um, so we built a laser that looks like this. Uh, I won't go through the details, but the trick here was to amplify up to an energy now of only 200 joules. In fact, we run at about 190 joules now, okay? So it's a bit less than that first Nova petawatt, but the pulse duration is substantially shorter, okay? So we now run with a peak pulse uh, power of about 1.3 petawatts. So I get to boast that that's 
presently the highest power laser in the world, and I think I've just edged out Mike Perry's power record, and I give him crap about it all the time. So anyway, so here it is, it's worked, you know, a lot of, you know, even though we haven't really pushed the power to a higher level, we actually did a lot in the technology and moved beyond that first uh, Livermore pedal. I, I give Mark a hard, Mike a hard time, but that was actually a really amazing uh, demonstration. Um, but we've made it much more compact. Here you can see our, our, our uh, system. Those blue boxes may look familiar if you were looking closely. I know I'm going quickly, but, but those blue boxes uh, are actually Nova amplifier components. Okay, so I'll, I'll talk about that here in a second. So, so our, our laser in Texas, uh, you know, fits underground uh, right there on campus and essentially sits in a big clean room uh, where we amplify the pulses. The amplifiers essentially sit on a tabletop. I, I admit it's a big table, but it is, it is tabletop nonetheless. Um, and then the pulses come out in a big tank and compress and go into, tar go into target chambers. I'll just show you, do, do a whirlwind photo tour here. Um, so the first thing, basically you have to amplify the pulse by, we're, we're amplifying by an order of about 10 billion or so, okay? So we're starting with the energy essentially of a mosquito, and we're going up to, to 200 joules, which is the energy in a cup of coffee, I admit. Okay, but it's, it's, it's about how quickly you deliver it. Uh, so anyway, here's the front end. Okay, you amplify, amplify up to, you know, up to a few joules. Then the amplifiers get larger. So the next step is we go through that silicate glass. Okay. So um, we actually, turns out the technology to make this silicate is, it was a sort of a lost art. We couldn't actually get this in the U.S. We had to go to China to get silicate. That's going to be changing. I'll talk about that at the end. We are, we're, we're getting our friends here in the U.S. to, to, to uh, rebuild the ability to make these new, these, these other glasses. But anyway, went to China, got, got a silicate glass amplifier rod. In our case, it's about 64 millimeters in diameter. We can amplify up to about 30 joules in that amplifier. These are all flash lamp pumps. So these are high voltage lines which come in, are connected to flash lamps. Lamps light up and excite the amplifier material. And then our final amplifier are old Nova surplus disc amplifier. So this actually worked out great. Nova was being turned off at the time I went to Texas. I said, hey, well, you guys, can I have some of those? Right, so, uh, so I applied to DOE and they uh, graciously uh, offered us uh, hardware from the Nova laser. Um, these are neat, actually. I mean, this is like 1982 technology and there hasn't been much improvement made on it since then. It's, it's, this is actually pretty clever, uh, the way these guys built this thing. Uh, these are glass disc amplifiers set at Brewster angle and then on the back side there are, there are big lamps Pulse to 20 kilovolts, lamps light up, excite the laser material, and the pulse travels through and gets amplified up to about 200 joules. So at the end of the day, I mean, Keith comes from a, a, a pulse power background. That, you know, a big laser like this is ultimately just a big pulse power machine. Uh, here's a capacitor bank. I just like this, like to show this because I like big ass capacitors. Um, anyway, so um, anyway, here's Erhard Gall, who's my chief laser scientist, teaching me how the laser works. So anyway. So the thing that's kind of cool now, well, let's, we'll start getting to the science we do with this here in a second, um, is the conditions we create, of course, are extreme. Everybody here works in sort of extreme conditions in one way or the other, but it's kind of, kind of cool. We have to start treating the target area like an accelerator lab, okay? And we have to shield this now in the same way you would accelerate a high energy accelerator. So here's us building the, uh, the shielding for the target bay back in 2005, I guess. We installed a big vacuum tank to, com to compress the pulse. So inside this tank, are two gratings, these are made by Livermore, okay? At the time that we got these gratings, we, they were only four in existence. The first two were built by Livermore for the Titan laser. We got the second two, they since have made a few others, but they're still a fairly rare artifact. So I tell my students don't sneeze around them. So anyway, um, these are mounted inside here. Yeah, those are, these are two of my most prized possessions, I have to say, are these two big gratings. These, these gratings, um, well, I don't go into details, but these, these are pretty, a pretty, a pretty neat optic, actually. The old gratings that Livermore used for the first petawatt were based on gold, a gold coating. Okay. Technology is advanced now. This is a dielectric coating, so this has a much higher damage threshold. We can put more juice onto it without damaging it. And that's going to be the technology which is ultimately going to let us go to higher power. So remember that. We'll come back to that at the end. Uh, anyway, there's just some cool photos of, of the uh, big optics in our compressor tank. Um, Anyway, so then this pulse comes out, and then it goes to one of two target areas. Okay, so we can we can uh, we compress down to, like I said, about 130 to 150 femtoseconds. We have an energy of about 180 joules. Pulse can now come in. We either focus it weakly into a gas, or we can focus it tightly 
uh, into uh, a solid target. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of a sense of what we do. So this is now uh, my uh, segue into what kind of science do we do, we do with this, these kinds of lasers. OK, so here's, this is my favorite number of all. If you focus a petawatt laser beam to a small spot, the intensity as measured in power per unit area, we use this bastardized watts per square centimeter in laser jock parlance, uh, the intensity is remarkable, okay? So for, for, for scale, for comparison, if you have a 100 watt light bulb, you know, not surprisingly near that light bulb, the intensity is a, a few tens of milliwatts per square centimeter, okay? And that's comparable to what sunlight is on the Earth, okay? If you fly out to the surface of the sun, you're just be able to sit right, right on the surface of the sun, light intensity is something like 10 kilowatts per square centimeter, okay? Now, my astrophysics friends tell me that near a gamma ray burst, which is one of the most energetic events in the universe, the electromagnetic flux at times exceeds or is in the vicinity of 10 to the 20 watts per square centimeter. Now, when we focus our petawatt laser, we produce intensities of something like 10 to the 21 watts per square centimeter. So we, without exaggeration, I can say we have the brightest light in the universe. So now what do you do with this? Well, you shoot it at things, well, what happens? I think the answer is probably obvious. You've all done this experiment. If you're, if you're, if you're, <laughs> if you're demented like me, you've done this experiment, you know that focus light makes things hot, okay? And so that really is the name of the game here, is we can use these very high peak intensities to create very extreme states of matter, okay? So let's put some, some numbers to, to, that, to those intensities to, to give you a sense of, of the kind of extremes we can access. So at the intensity we can produce now with a petawatt laser in the vicinity of 10 to the 21 watts per square centimeter, the electric field that's associated with that is something on the order of 10 to the 12 volts per centimeter. Okay, now that's a, almost a thousand times the electric field felt by an electron in an atom. Okay, so you know, the, the whole idea of using perturbation theory to, to understand how this light interacts with matter, of course, is absurd, right? The, the, the fields are much stronger than any fields holding matter together, okay? Um, that electric field, of course, drives an, an electron to quiver. And at these intensities, the energy of that electron as it quivers is of the order of megavolts, okay? So the electron essentially reaches relativistic velocity in less than one wavelength, okay? Now, if you think about this focus light instead of in terms of field, but you think about it as concentrated energy, you can think of this as a kind of a light bullet, which we focus down to about, a, about 10 micron spot size. That's also about the length of the pulse, okay? That is an energy density of something like 10 to the 11 joules per cubic centimeter. If you were to put that into matter, that would be the equivalent of energy of about one megavolt for every atom at solid density, okay? So it gives you a, a sense of scale of the sort of temperatures you can imagine reaching with, with these very intense, intense pulses. And a number I also like is the pressure. Of course, you just take I over C, and it turns out the pressure of these pulses is, is uh, terabars, tr trillions of atmospheres, okay? So we use this to study high energy density physics. Many of you in this room work in high energy density physics, so I, I, don't, I, won't, I won't dwell on the point, but you know, HED matter sort of is a nebulous concept, but in the community, we, we, we sort of generally dis define it as, macroscopic amounts of matter with energy density such that they would be equivalent to a pressure of greater than a megabar, okay? So I plotted here sort of density of, well, I do it in terms of plasma over basically 25 orders of magnitude, and here's seven orders of magnitude of temperature. Of course, room temperature here is the white line. We live more or less to the left of this. Of course, at higher temperatures, the material becomes ionized, or does it? Okay, that's a question we'll come back to. Uh, here's, that, here's that line that sort of is the kind of nebulous delineation of when high energy density matter begins. Of course, the, you know, the machines is NIF, okay, and the conditions that they reach in an implosion are actually really remarkable. Um, but it's actually hard to do experiments on this. There's a lot of stuff around it. There's a whole room, there's 192 beams. It's not really a, a spectacular place to do real quantitative measurements many states of matter. So, so one of the things that's nice with these short pulse lasers is we can shoot either into gases or onto solids and create, well, gases or solids, and create temperatures of kilovolts or tens of kilovolts um, and uh, densities that are at least as high as solids. So we'll talk about that. And then I'm also gonna just mention kind of a more exotic 
state of matter that we're, tr that we're trying to create in our lab. So, so if you think about the kinds of things that you might shoot this at, you can sort of think of a spectrum of sizes, starting from, well, essentially all the way down to single electrons uh, up to solids. And, and the kind of physics that you access when you shoot at an atom versus a molecule versus a cluster versus a solid is different. And in our group, we do, we do all the above. We do experiments across, across the, 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 the size range. So I'm going to just give you a very quick sampling of some of the kinds of experiments we do. This is, again, a, a whirlwind tour, I admit. Um, but I want to get to uh, next generation lasers again. So, so, so just to start off with, ask yourself, you know, how does, how does light this intense interact with single atoms? Right? One, of the, one of the oldest questions in, you know, in, in modern physics is, you know, how, how is material ionized when you shine light at it? You know, photoelectric effect sort of question. Okay. Well, at these very high intensities, the way atoms ionize become you know, quite exotic. In fact, as I said, the electric field of the laser is comparable or ends up being quite a bit bigger than the electric field binding an electron in, a, in, a, in an atom. So here's a 1 over r potential in an atom. The little electron wave packet sits there. Now this laser comes along and literally rips it apart. And, and essentially what happens is the electron can tunnel out. Um, so as we've gone up in intensity, the charge states that we can access have gone up higher and higher as well. We're getting to the point we can now rip into the case shell of, of some ions. We're, we're doing experiments here on the petawatt. We want to push up to at least 10 to the 21 watts per square centimeter and see if we can now start to see relativistic effects playing a role in how these atoms ionize. Uh, one of the things that's, that's kind of interesting then, getting back to the question, of course, in the photoelectric effect, we know you, sign, you shine light on a solid, you know, with the photon energies above the work function. Electron comes out with an energy which is just h bar omega minus the, the work function. Okay, that's, we've done that for 100 years, right? Um, what energy do the electrons come out when you do an experiment like this? Well, it turns out they, could pro they probably come out with pretty large energies. This is a simulation of, our, of where we hope to be on the Texas Petawatt, where we ionize argon 17 plus. Here's what we expect in terms of the electron energy as a function of the angle ejected. And so rather than coming out with EV of energy, like you imagine in a photoelectric effect, we're expecting electrons to come out with nearly a GeV of energy. And what we think is going to happen is that the electron, when it gets ionized, picks up on the wave and it surfs along and starts picking up lots of energy and gets catapulted out of the focus. So we're, we're working on that to, uh, to observe ex very high energy photoelectrons. Okay. All right, so, so the next up on the, uh, the scale of size things we can shoot, um, th this is an area that I'm, I've been particularly interested in and worked in for a long time, is understanding how these intense pulses interact with clusters. So, okay, so you can imagine making little icicles, if you will. Uh, you know, choose your favorite atom, but uh, you can typically use something that, that forms, uh, you know, van der Waals bonds, you know, noble gases, xenon, hydrogen, we can get to do this. And when you shoot this with an intense laser, the forces now can pull off these electrons on a time scale faster than the cluster explodes. So you can make this little charged ball. And of course, those Coulomb forces can be pretty large, and they'll drive a pretty violent explosion of these clusters. So, so we've, we've been looking at this at various power levels over the years. One of the things that I thought was cool, and I did this initially while I was at Livermore before I came to Texas, is to take a short pulse and, and shoot it into a jet of deuterium clusters. So now you have all these little deuterium icicles. Laser comes along, rips off all the electrons before the ions can move. So the electrons are gone, they don't, they don't know it. Okay? Now they want to repel each other and they explode, and they explode now with kilovolts of energy. So what you're left with after picoseconds of time, which to me is an eternity of time, after picoseconds of time is a plasma with an ion temperature, an ion temperature of tens of kilovolts, right? So that's center of the sun kind of temperatures. And sure enough, you see a burst, in our case, when we shoot deuterium clusters, a little burst of fusion neutrons, okay? So we're trying to make that little burst of fusion neutrons not so little. I'm particularly interested in trying to use these neutrons to do time-resolved material science studies. So we've been pushing on the Texas Petawatt to push that fusion yield to higher and higher numbers. And essentially where we're at now is something like 2 times 10 to the 7 neutrons per shot, okay? When I, when I proposed this thing to the NNSA 10 years ago, I, I predicted we'd get 10 to the 8. So I'm cracking the whip on my students. They can't come out of the lab until we get five times more neutrons. Um, anyway, so, so here's, <laughs> you guys like, that's not funny. So, <laughs> okay, here's a picture of the experiment. We shoot the, we shoot the petawatt down a long tube, focus it very weakly into a gas jet, which is cryogenically cooled. That little spark right there, that's my little tabletop star. Okay, and we get a burst of neutrons. Anywhere here's a detector. We can see ion temperatures of 20 kilovolts, and we get a nice grand burst of neutrons. Now, 
Neutron yield on the scale of, say, NIF is not that large, although these neutron yields are actually within a couple orders of magnitude of what they used to get on NOVA with, implo with imploding shells. Um, but the instantaneous neutron fluxes here is enormous because the neutrons come out in the order of picoseconds, okay? So the instantaneous, instantaneous neutron flux right up next to that is actually pretty large. Uh, and there's some interesting things we can look at, but we'd like to go further. So we've been working with Sandia um, on an idea where we might enclose that little fusion spark in a strong magnetic field, okay? So our friends at Sandia have built for us a pulse power machine. Right now it's, it's operating uh, at there's a kiloamps. It also ultimately will be at the end of the of the fall this year, operating at two mega amps, and we pulse that into a little coil, and we're shooting the gas jet into that coil and shooting the laser into that. And the idea is to produce 200 Tesla fields that will magnetically confine that little fusion plasma that we produce. Okay, and so our predictions are that we may get at least a factor of 100 more neutron yield. At that point, I get to say I'm, I'm, we're, at, we're at least as high as the old Nova, the old Nova experiments. Okay, um, so now moving to the next topic. This is again this whirlwind tour. One of the things we're interested in is accelerating particles. And I remember I showed you how we bait, we built the target area almost like an accelerator bay with large shielding. So my colleague Mike Downer has been working for years on this idea of using a femtosecond pulse focused into a gas. And is that because of the strong pressure associated with that focus pulse, it essentially produces a, a wave, a wake, just like a boat traveling through water produces a wake, okay? And as dolphins have figured out, they can surf along that and pick up energy. Electrons do the same thing, okay? So this wake field generation uh, has been shown to produce electrons of hundreds of MeV of energy using sort of hundreds of terawatt laser pulses, okay? So the, Laser travels through gas, produces this, this plasma oscillation, electrons surf along. Now, the, the gradients that you can produce are something like a GeV per centimeter. Okay, now for scale, since of scale, slack produces electrons of around 100 GeV, right? And that's over three kilometers. Okay, if you can produce a plasma like this that's of the order of 10 centimeters long, you can imagine producing electrons that are accelerated to something like 10% of the energy of slack in a distance like that, okay? So that's what Mike is trying to do on the Texas Petawatt. Uh, he's done initial experiments. I, I, I didn't get any data to show here. He's sort of, he's produced electrons just below a GeV at the moment. He's, a few, he's at a few hundred MeV, just under a GeV, uh, but he's gonna be pushing that this fall, and anyway, we have high hopes. But this, is, this essentially becomes what looks like an accelerator experiment. You have big, strong magnets and uh, lots of shielding and all kinds of cool stuff, so, okay. Next topic I want to, want to just mention is, okay, we've talked about shooting atoms, we've talked about clusters, we've talked about gases. What happens if you shoot onto a solid, all right? Well, kind of the obvious thing happens, as I mentioned, you make things hot. You imagine shooting this laser onto a solid. Now, the great thing about these femtosecond lasers is that you can deposit energy on a time scale faster than anything expands. That's how, the, that's how that whole cluster gets blown up, right? You, you hit it, you zap it before anything knows that's going on. Same thing happens with a solid target. And if you think now, I've plotted now temperature and density. The axes are flipped from my other, but anyway. So here we are at cold, at solid density. If I can shoot this with a, a short pulse laser, I can heat it faster than it expands. So if it expands, it wants to go to low density. I heat it very quickly. And in principle, I can access some pretty interesting states of matter by heating something at solid density to higher and higher temperatures, okay? And we're ultimately striving to get to kilovolt type temperatures. But at, but at, these, but at these conditions, the plasmas are, 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 are pretty exotic, right? I mean, they're degenerate for, for at least over the temperatures of up to, to tens of EV, okay? There's really an open question is, is it really ionized? I mean, it's something that's this dense. Are the electrons really free or are they in, you know, some sort of, uh, you, know, you know, sort of interesting state that it's not, can't be completely described as fully ionized, right? The whole idea, those of you who are plasma physicists in the, in the room, you know when you, when you study plasma physics, the first chapter in the textbook is you say, okay, we're gonna ignore everything but two body collisions, right? We're not beyond two body collisions is too complex. Well, that just, that just doesn't work for these dense, these dense plasmas, okay? Um, so s plasmas like this are found, you know, in a lot of places, it turns out. I mean, in fact, actually the center of the, st of the sun is, a, is actually pretty dense, pretty dense plasma, okay? And, and then, of course, brown dwarfs uh, sort of sit here. They're degenerate. So the hope is if we, can, if we can do experiments 
that we create matter like this in the lab, we can study very fundamental properties like, what is it conduct, you know, conductive? It turns out these plasmas actually are really not very good conductors at all, okay? So you think of a plasma being a conductor. Well, this stuff isn't, okay? So we look at conductivity, what, you know, what's the pressure? Just sort of fundamental properties of, of, these, of this material in the hope of gleaning some information about, you know, white dwarf center stars. Uh, and this also has relevance to inertial confinement fusion. So the way we do this is we focus to a high intensity on a, on a solid target. It turns out it's not just so easy as just shooting onto, onto a chunk of something. Uh, this laser, when it hits a solid, has very high fields and it bangs electrons around, for example. So one of the things we know, these, these electrons get zipped around at relativistic energy and they zoom in. So it's not so straightforward just to, just to shoot a solid, but we do actually play a trick. We take advantage of those fast electrons zipping around and we use those electrons to accelerate protons. So if you shoot onto a solid target and you, you push electrons through at megavolts of energy, they'll come out the backside if the target is thin and produce a sheath field which accelerates protons. So it turns out this ends up being a pretty efficient way to accelerate protons. We can, we can put something like 10% of the laser energy into a beam of protons, and now we can use the protons as our blowtorch. Okay, so here's, here's a data from our experiment at Livermore on the Titan laser. This is a quarter petawatt laser at Livermore. And you can see we're producing protons of the order of, uh, you know, 1 to 10 MeV. So we're, doing, we're using this to, to generate beams of protons, which are a blowtorch to heat a second target. So here's our little proton accelerator, our miniature little proton accelerator. The protons now zap in and heat matter to these high temperature dense states. Okay, and we did an experiment. This is, this is something we did in aluminum. We, we said, well, gosh, you know, the, the Los Alamos guys certainly know the equation state of aluminum perfectly, one would think. So we actually measured the equation of state of aluminum. The way we do that is you look at how quickly it expands when you heat it. The expansion speed is related to its pressure, right? So the equation of state, of course, gives you the pressure at certain density and temperature. In our case, we didn't heat to very high temperatures. We heated to about 20 EV, but there was solid density. And it turns out, lo and behold, that even the vaunted sesame tables don't give quite the right answer. In fact, they're, they're actually, we found that they're in this regime very slightly off. And we, we're, we're working with folks at Livermore uh, to even improve these EOS tables. And this is aluminum, which is something we're supposed to know, okay? Throw more electrons in, D electrons, 4F electrons, you know, all hell breaks loose. Cats sleep with dogs and all kinds of, so there's all kinds of really, uh, uh, you know, sort of untilled ground here in terms of understanding fundamental properties uh, in this, uh, in this regime. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about before we now get to, uh, get to uh, the next generation of lasers is uh, something that's a bit more exotic, okay? And this actually came, idea came from experiments done on the first petawatt at Livermore. My friend Edison Liang, who's an astrophysicist down at Rice, said, well, you know, near a black hole, the plasmas are so, so, so hot that electrons are in equilibrium producing pairs, okay? And they actually produce pair plasmas, so the plasma is produced of, of in equilibrium electrons and positrons, and it's believed that shock waves in those plasmas are what give rise to gamma ray bursts. Okay, annihilation, radiation gets, occurs, and what have you. Okay, so this is all, this is all really exotic physics, which I, I have to admit I don't understand really well, but, 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 the, but understanding gamma ray bursts is, is, is something that would be very interesting, particularly if I could make a tiny little bit of it in my lab. Okay, so, so it turns out the Livermore petawatt actually um, did see a small number of positrons when they shot onto a solid target. And then the laser got turned off and nothing ever came of that, okay? So we're not picking that up now. We, we just finished an experiment. I was going to try to show you some data, but I didn't get it in time. Anyway, we just did an experiment we finished up a couple weeks ago where we're trying to produce a burst of positrons in the hope of producing a tiny little volume of relativistic matter. Okay, so this would be a macroscopic amount of matter that's at a relativistic temperature, okay? And we've seen, so we looked at the electrons, we now have seen higher energy electrons than they ever saw in the Livermore petawatt. We've seen up to about 80 MeV electrons. Still looking for positrons, but we think they're there. Anyway, so that's, that's happening. Okay, so that's, so I wanna, now I wanna, I wanna finish up here and ask, where are we going next? Okay, we still have a lot of science to be done with these petawatt lasers. Always thinking ahead. Okay, so here I plot, essentially a phase space of laser technology. Here's pulse duration and laser energy, and these are ISO power contours, right? So essentially, in my world of lasers, technology has been this march this way, to higher energies and shorter pulses. Now, at the end of the day, we're, we're about as short as we can get in terms of pulse duration, but we're not as high as we can get in energy. So here we are, and I plot uh, 
Some of the lasers in the US, okay, here's where we're at. This is the old Nova Petawatt that was turned off. Uh, here's the laser at Z in Sandia. Uh, Titan, where we did those proton experiments at Livermore, okay. A uh, big laser's just been activated at Rochester. It's longer pulse with a glass laser, uh, on and on and on. This is a Thai Sapphire laser in Nebraska. Uh, and ultimately, there will be a big glass CPA laser on NIF. They're, they're going to strive for longer pulses for the, in terms of the, the application, so it's not, um, but it's still a pretty bloody big laser. Uh, anyway, um, so the question is, is it possible to get out here? And if we could, why would you want to do it? So that's, that's, that's where we're going. Um, the, the physics you might access is, could potentially be pretty interesting. Um, if you think about the focused intensity you might access, it would be maybe of the order of 10 to the 25 watts per square centimeter if I could produce an exawatt. So an exawatt is 10 to the 18 watts, okay? So 1,000 petawatts. The light, I love this, the light pressure is a petabar, okay? The, the electrons are now quivering with an energy comparable to the energy at slack, okay? So in one wavelength, electrons are picking up an energy that's about 10% of slack. And in fact, the protons now start to quiver almost relativistically, okay? So you might even imagine not just producing pair plasmas, but producing relativistic ion plasmas, okay? So what would you study? Uh, you know, it's still, it's still open to conjecture, but you know, you might imagine accelerating electrons to TeV energies. Um, producing relativistic ion plasmas, like I've mentioned, and I'll talk about probing the vacuum, which is the most exciting thing at all. So, so this is just, a, you know, a kind of a conjecture on what we might do with an exawatt laser. Okay, so here's, here's a plot of, of neutron yield that we've produced with this cluster fusion trick. Here's the latest data on the Texas Petawatt. Remember I told you we're trying to get to 10 to the 8. Um, with an exawatt, you follow the scaling, which, is, which, is, which has been, been true uh, over many orders of magnitude of, of fusion yield as a function of laser pulse energy. As long as the pulse is short enough, you might imagine we could produce um, essentially joule y fusion yields, okay? So we're talking about in DD, okay? So we're talking about really remarkable environments. You might imagine producing macroscopic plasmas where you could probe nucleosynthesis, right? So how, how, are the, how are the exotic nuclei, those of you nuclear physicists know more about this than I do, um, but, but you know, nucleosynthesis is an open question. There's been some talk of doing this on NIF, okay? Producing an environment where you might study the production of, of exotic nuclei in a, in a hot, dense plasma. And, and so if you did this with an exawatt, the density with this approach, the density is 10 to the 7 less than NIF, admittedly, but the plasma's around for much longer, some 10 to the 3 times longer. The volumes are bigger because now we're focusing of, of, of exawatts probably to the scale of centimeters in size, and the shot rate's probably 100 to 1,000 times higher, right? On NIF, you're probably going to do this with one shot. Here, here, if we reparate this laser, you maybe do a shot every uh, 100 seconds or so, okay? So that's, I would argue that this is a potentially a platform for doing nucleosynthesis, which would be, very, which would be pretty interesting stuff, okay? Um, you know, I talked about making macroscopic amounts of electron positron plasma, okay? You might even imagine with an exawatt, just from the light pressure, actually accelerating macroscopic amounts of matter, ions and all, to relativistic velocities, okay? So that, just, you know, think about that for a second. Actually producing, you know, a, an amount of matter, maybe not as big as a dime, but, but actually a macroscopic amount of matter traveling at relativistic velocity. I don't, the, too many details on this view graph, I won't, I won't mention it. Talk about it, but anyway, so this is, I think, the coolest thing of all. So, so when we think of the vacuum, okay, I think of vacuum as nothing, um, but, but if, you, if, you, you know, if you look at you know, the Dirac equation in uh, quantum mechanics, that argues that, in fact, there's, always, there's this constant C of virtual pairs being produced, okay? So by the uncertainty principle, a, an electron-positron pair can live for a very, very short period of time, okay? So this is presumably, in the vacuum, this is happening all the time. Now, this has no observable effect to us, okay? But, but we strongly suspect that it's there. If we had a strong enough laser pulse, potentially the electric field could interact with these virtual pairs, right? These virtual pairs, in a sense, are like tiny little dipoles, which only last 10 to the minus 21 seconds, okay? But the field was strong enough, you can imagine interacting with these pairs and, see, and seeing some observable effect, okay? And there's the fundamental QED questions that one might imagine tickling with a laser like this. So, I mean, one of the things I think is kind of provocative, you know, why don't vacuum fluctuations have a gravitational force, right? Why don't they gravitate? So, so you know, the, 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 the idea is um, if you had a strong enough field, and we won't get there with an exo, but if you had enough strong enough field, you can actually make positron pairs tunnel in the same way that atoms ionize by tunneling, okay? 
And the field required is something like an intensity equivalent to 10 to the 29 watts per square centimeter. We won't get there, but we do know that in atoms, before we make them ionize, we make them nonlinear and we do nonlinear optics. So you can imagine doing nonlinear optics in the vacuum. And one of the things you could perhaps do is do birefringence. Look at the refractive index change in vacuum. So this would be experiments in nothing. So anyway, I, we, we joke, you know, in, laser, in this laser field, we, you have to build these big expensive targets. You know, the NIF targets are very expensive. I say the great advantage of this experiment is that the targets are cheap. Right. So. Okay, so, so, th so just, to, just to coming to the end now is, okay, can we go beyond a petawatt? And I believe the answer certainly is yes, and we could do this soon. Okay, in fact, the Europeans are getting ahead of us on this. Uh, the Europeans have established uh, a project funded by the EU. It's about a billion euro project to fund three pillars called the extreme light infrastructure. And they're in the east for, for political and uh, economic development reasons. Uh, but, the, but the thrust of these three pillars is to develop lasers beyond a petawatt to do physics like electron acceleration, uh, add a second pulse generation, et cetera, et cetera. But so they are going forward and have the funding to build a series of 10 petawatt lasers. So anyway, so I'm up to my eyeballs in this. This is pretty neat stuff. Uh, we're actually, um, we've been asked and we've worked and we've designed the 10 petawatt laser for the check pillar. Okay, here's, my, here's, here's our design. Anyway, we're gonna be pushing this glass technology, this mixed glass idea, from the 200 joule level to the kilojoule level. Okay, so essentially a factor of 10 in energy by retaining a short pulse, okay? And what's more, we're gonna be pushing the rep rate to higher shot, higher shot rates than those old Nova amplifiers, okay? So this uh, laser will, if all goes well, and it never does, right, built by 2015, okay? Um, so this is, this is happening, I, you know, we're, we're hoping we can maybe get some momentum here in the US to do something similar. So now the last question is, well then how do you get to an exawatt? Okay, it looks like we may be on the verge of producing 10 petawatt lasers. Could we ever get to an exawatt and we, could we do this on a realistic time scale? And I think the answer is yes. We're probably gonna need some new materials. If I, if I just amplify more and more and more in glass, eventually that gain narrowing narrows the spectrum and the pulse gets long and it doesn't work, okay? But there are potentially different kinds of glasses. Remember I told you we just used old silicate from back in the day plus Nova NIF style glass. There are other glass recipes. So we're now working with shot, shot glass built all the NIF glass. They have a big facility in, in Pennsylvania where they rolled out, you know, thousands of these slabs, okay. Uh, we now have a project. They're developing new glasses which have different gain profiles. And the thought is if we can put all these things together, we might imagine building a laser that operates at 100 kilojoules and 100 femtoseconds, okay. It would probably look like this. 100 kilojoules, well, heck, we already know how to do that, okay, NIF, one beam line of NIF is 10 kilojoules. So a NIF bundle is eight of these. If we could operate a bundle at 15 kilojoules and with these fancy glasses and all the tricks which we've already developed, you could imagine producing a laser which was of the order of 120 kilojoules and 120 femtoseconds. Now, a NIF bundle is not that large of a laser. I mean, yes, it's big, but, but this, is, this is certainly not NIF scale. I mean, this is more the scale of Z, for example, of Sandia. Okay, we would need to compress it. I admit that that's a bit of a challenge. Our thinking now is we probably take those gratings I showed you and we would tile a bunch of them together into a big array and use those as a big compressor. I mean, it probably needs to be something like two meters by, by six or eight meters. But, but that's not the question. And like I said, the technology to do the final amplification exists. This is beamlet at Sandia, okay? I mean, this is a, this is a tens of kilojoule laser sitting there. And I have, uh, anyway, you can imagine uh, what we might think about doing with, with beamlet using these new materials. And tiling these gratings together is something that has been demonstrated as well. At Rochester, on their, on their big laser, they have tiled three gratings together. So, if, Lord, if the, if the Rochester guys can tile three, I certainly can put together 15 gratings, right? So, so this is, I'm trivializing it. It's not, it's challenging, I admit. But, uh, but anyway, the point is this is just not, just not an outrageous possibility. So, so I'll finish with a set of rhetorical questions, but you know, can we build a 10 petawatt laser in five years? The answer well, certainly is yes. The Europeans are doing it now. You know, how do we push? I've kind of answered some of these questions already. How do we get there? Do we use Thai Sapphire? Um, can we build an next one in the time scale of 10 years? I think the answer probably is yes. The science case for this still has to be developed, um, but the community is talking about that. Okay, so with that, I will finish and entertain any questions if you have any.